this lecture, I'm going to talk about poetry in action and the way that language in poetry does not just inform, but also performs. It does things. The first basic question to ask is just, how does a sentence work? What happens when we hear or speak a sentence? A very basic and simple understanding of language is that sentences are descriptive. That is, words carry information, those words are communicated within a frame of reference, and the receiver of those words decodes them and thus gets the information that is there. And this is a simplified version of our old rhetorical situation, uh, circle and triangle, with the text and the relationship between the speaker and addressee in the center surrounded by the context. So this is a focus on that text and context. Some simple examples of language in its descriptive function, language as describing. So he went to the store. I cannot afford my medical bills. She feels depressed. The online assignments are due on Saturday. These are all statements that uh, transmit factual or information that's purported to be factual about who, what, when, where, etc. So this is just describing what's out there in the world. And again, this is a basic understanding of how language works at its simplest level. However, as a very important linguist argued, Language, when we look at it, is not purely descriptive. There are many statements that we can call performatives. These are st sentences or statements that don't report or transmit at information, but they actually perform the action they describe. Or we might say that instead of just describing what's out there externally in the world, they affect and operate within that world in order to change it, in order to cause something to come about. And if this sounds a little bit more like magic, it, it is a little bit like magic. But in a sense, that's how language works, like magic. So here are some very basic examples of performative kinds of sentences. I promise to pay you back. So when I say I promise to pay you back, that's not me describing something. That's me actually making that promise, performing the act of promising. Or I dedicate this performance to my dearly departed mother. Again, in saying that, I am performing the dedication. I'm not describing the performance, but I'm doing something to it. And again, perhaps most famously, I now pronounce you husband and wife, or husband and husband, or wife and wife, or wife and husband. By saying those words, of course, along with various legal documents, but in the act of saying those words, the priest or registrant or judge or whoever makes those people into married partners. So these are all statements that don't just describe something that's out there, they actually do something. Now here's the thing, that same linguist who talked about performatives, John Searle, he also went one step further and said, well, when we really think about it, all language is performative. Even the most simple descriptive sounding sentences are actually performing. So if you say, he went to the store, in essence, that's I assert that he went to the store. You are making that assertion. And you're also perhaps implying with that assertion, and you should believe me when I tell you that. You are asserting your trustworthiness. If you say, I cannot afford my medical bills, you are demonstrating your suffering by giving that information. And perhaps also suggesting or looking for help in some manner from the other person. If I say the online assignments are due on Saturday, I'm not just giving you information about them, but I'm reminding you that the assignments are due this Saturday so you know to do them, and probably also strongly suggesting that you start to work on them soon. So these are all things that are being performed even although the sentences seem like they're just describing something very basic and factual. How do we get access to or understand these actions that are being performed within a supposedly descriptive statement? Well, it's again, the context and the relationship. The actions are shaped by what the situation is, what's going on, and who these people are that are speaking to each other. So what are the power dynamics between them? What's the desired outcome from one party or the other? Are there unconscious thoughts or feelings that are shaping it? Is there a past history? So when I say the online assignments are due on Saturday, there's a power dynamic there. I'm the professor, I have a certain authority to declare when these things are due and thus to get you to do these things. So I'm asserting my authority. So that's part of what's going on in that 
speech, in that action that's going on through the words. So I want you to study as well, so I'm reminding you now. I want you to do the work. So those desired outcomes are shaping what I say and influencing the message that you receive. Let's look at some examples of speech actions, of speech inaction. So consider the statement, I love you. Now, what if you say this, you're saying this to a close friend of yours who's just been dumped? What is, what are you doing when you say I love you? Maybe you're trying to comfort them. What if that close friend is also your secret crush and you've been watching them suffer, getting dumped by jerk after jerk, and you say I love you? Well, you're trying to comfort them, but you're also saying, hey, I'm here, you know, take a look at me. Maybe I'm the one that you want. Or if you're saying it when you're proposing to your significant other, I love you, right? You're, it's part of the proposal. You are, it is the proposal in some sense. It's a way to convince them. It's a way to show them that you're serious in your proposal. What if it's your significant other, other or perhaps former significant other who's leaving forever? You're never going to see this person again. You're breaking up, but you still love them. And you say, I love you. You're not just giving them information. You're saying, please don't leave. Or I'll never be the same without you. I can't live without you, whatever it might be. Or if they're just going to work, then I love you is very different. It's have a nice day. It's I'll be thinking about you. It's hope you're thinking about me. So the simple statement, I love you, which seems very obvious in its meaning, means very different things depending on our context and situation, who we're talking to. What a nice jacket. Too bad I can't afford it. Well, say you're at the mall on a shopping trip with your parents and you say that. What a nice jacket. Too bad I can't afford it. Well, what are you doing? You're sort of hinting at your parents. Hey, maybe you want to buy it for me? Could you please buy this? Boy, it'd really make me happy if you bought me this present. Or what if your very rich friend comes up and they're wearing a fancy new jacket and you say, wow, what a nice jacket. Too bad I can't afford it. You're sort of showing them that you're irritated. You're angry at them. You're kind of insulting them a little bit, saying, hey, why are you rubbing my face in it that you can buy these nice clothes that I can't? What if you're in a struggling clothing store and it's right before closing time and you say, hmm, wow, you've got a really nice jacket here. Oh, well, it's too bad I can't afford it. It's a little expensive. Well, what are you doing then? Well, you're, you're hinting to the person, hey, I might be willing to buy this if you'll lower the price a little bit. You're putting a little pressure on them. You're trying to convince them. You're trying to uh, uh, make it worth their while, so to speak. Here's a completely simple, banal, stupid statement. I went to the store. So basic. Of course, it could it mean anything else besides I went to the store. It's just telling us this basic information. Well, what if you're being, what if a detective is, is interrogating you? The detective investigating a murder. You say, I went to the store. You're also, you're giving an alibi. You're saying, I didn't do it. You're saying, hey, don't pay attention to me. Don't look at me as the, the murderer. I'm not the one who did it. I was someplace else at the time. You're defending yourself, proclaiming your innocence. What if you say, I went to the store to your lazy roommate who just woke up? Well, you're saying, hey, bum, you need to get off your butt and do something. You're telling them that you don't really appreciate their laziness. You're showing them that you're a good roommate and they're not. Now, what if you're saying it to your significant other who might suspect that you're cheating on them, wants to know, hey, where were you? Why have you been gone so long? I just went to the store. Again, you're proclaiming your innocence. You might be trying to hide what you really were doing if their suspicions aren't, uh, if their suspicions are correct. You could be defending yourself. You could be saying, hey, leave me alone. Why are you always hassling me? Why are you so jealous and suspicious? I didn't do anything. You're being ridiculous. I went to the store. So again, 
Very simple statement, but it can be very different actions. You can be performing different things by saying, I went to the store. So all of this is to say that the meaning of words is shaped by many different factors. These are the same factors that we talked about in, in terms of what shapes the poem. There's the context, the situation, where is it? When is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is it being spoken? Who are the participants? Who's speaking? Who's listening? Who's the speaker and audience? What are their relationships? Who are they to each other? Is it the detective and a suspect, a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, two strangers? And what are their intentions and goals? What does the speaker want? What does the audience want? What does the speaker think the audience wants from them? All these factors, just as they shape how we read a poem, they shape just the individual statements within the poem and the individual statements that we make in our day-to-day -day lives. So something as simple as I went to the store has a whole nother world of meaning within it, depending on So now let's think about how we can bring this concept of language as action. Language is not just communicating information, but as communicating intent, as having an effect on one person or from one person to another. How do we bring this into poetry? Well, we can think about poetic language as action itself. Everything that a speaker in a poem says is an action. They're performing a poetic act. We start, I think it's always important to start with the literal information and the idea expressed, what's literally being said, and then what are the possible immediate effects of receiving this information, of receiving this communication? What could those be? So for example, in To a Daughter Leaving Home, the speaker is saying literally, when you were a child, I taught you how to ride your bike. That's the information being communicated. And the immediate effect of that on the daughter might be sort of warm memory, feelings of love, of caring, remembering that their mother has been there for them. Might also be immediate effect of certain sadness of, oh, well, my mother's always been there for me since I was a child. She taught me how to ride a bike, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm going off on my own. My mom's not gonna be there for me. Maybe that's a little scary. So what's being said, what's the immediate effect? Southern gentle lady, they've hung a, a man, they've hung a black man in the dark of the moon literally telling the woman about a crime, but what's the effect of hearing about this crime? Are they shocked? Are they frightened? Are they horrified? Asking these questions and starting to provide answers can help us think
So moving beyond the literal, once we've got that down, we understand what's literally being spoken and what's literally being said and what the reactions to that might be given the context. We can ask, what are the implicit ideas? What's not spoken outright, but is suggested by the statement? And how does the relationship between the speaker and the addressee, between the speaker and the audience, how does that influence the meaning or the effect of the statement? So the mother says, when you were eight, I taught you how to ride a bike. The relationship between mother and daughter shapes that memory. It's not just a memory of one person teaching another person to do something, but their whole relationship, the nature of that mother-daughter bond is overlaid on this event, on this memory, on the statement. So it's being said within the context of, I'm your mother, you're my daughter. So the implicit ideas that are being suggested, the love that the mother has had, the care that the mother has had, the time that she's put into teaching her daughter, making her an adult now able to leave home, the pride, perhaps, that the mother feels in the daughter leaving, but also the fear and anxiety, the worry that they have. Just as they were worried that they might fall off the bike, she's worried about what's going to happen to her daughter now leaving home. So the explicit message, the explicit content is informed by this relationship and the history. And that's how we get these implicit ideas. That's how we And then we can move to an understanding of the situation as a whole. What is, why is the speaker expressing these particular ideas and why through these particular memories or details? What are the immediate goals that she or he might have in telling this story, in giving this information? And what governing intention or what overall desire, what overarching want might this action support? Might the speaker trying to pursue through these individual poetic acts, these individual acts of speech and the ideas that they're su suggesting? So the, the wife in A River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, she tells about their past together. She tells about when they were children growing up together. Why express those particular ideas? Why talk about their past? Why possibly invoke those, the memories of innocence and childhood play, that nostalgia? There's a kind of pleasantness there. So what immediate goal might that be? Well, just to remind the husband, to recall their past together, to reminisce with him. But in a larger sense, she's writing to her absent husband and at the end asking him to come home, saying she will meet him. So in some sense, this this small act of remembering is part of this overall intention to 
communicate and reconnect with her husband. So we build from the smallest level of the individual speech, the individual line or sentence, the individual statement that expresses some literal content, but that through that, through the relationship between the speaker and the audience has these additional deeper meanings, these other intentions behind it, which are all part of understanding the overall situation. What is happening between these two? What does the speaker want? And how are they trying to accomplish it through these various actions? Of course, thinking and talking about this is all well and good, but we're going to need to eventually write our ideas. So when you're talking about a poem, when you're talking about a speak, what a speaker is saying, don't just say the speaker says X, Y, and Z. It's not just about summarizing, but what is the action that they're, that they're performing? Try to come up with a specific verb. So instead of just saying, maybe the speaker is begging. Maybe they're questioning, they're attacking, they're apologizing, they're complaining, they're reminiscing, they're reminding, they're teasing, they're seducing, right? Think about the action, what's being done to the other person. What effect is the speaker having on the other person? How are they using their words to have that effect? And if you can define that action through a specific verb, you'll be well on your way to understanding the poem as a whole or the complexities of the poem and how the speaker works through all these different modes and these different actions and different uh, uh, ideas that they express. Now, how do we define these actions? How do we come up with these verbs to think about, to describe exactly what the speaker is doing? Well, some very simple things we can, questions we can ask ourselves. Is the action that they're performing or is their intention positive or negative? Are they trying to help the other person? Are they trying to connect with the other person in a good way? Are they trying to have a good effect on that person? Or are they trying to hurt the other person? Are they expressing something positive? Or they are they expressing something negative? Is the action overt or covert? Is it open or is it secret? Does the speaker say one thing and perhaps mean something very different? For example, when the mother says, I taught you how to ride a bike. She's telling about a memory, but there's also these other meanings, these covert meanings of I'm still worried for you. I'm worried now that you're going away. I'm proud of you, but I'm also scared. And does the action nurture the other person? Does it use the other person? Is it a manipulative thing? Does it damage them? Again, how do they feel about the person they are addressing? These are just some very simple categories that we can apply to start thinking about how to define uh, specifically what the action that the speaker is performing might be. All right, let's review what we've talked about today. So the first important point that I'm trying to make here is that all language performs as well as informs. It's not just about communicating information, but it's also about doing something to the other person, getting something from them. It's my birthday next week. I'm giving literal information about the date of my birthday. 
I'm informing you when it is, but I'm also suggesting, if you don't know that's when my birthday is, I'm suggesting or implying that I want something from you. It's my birthday next week. I might be reminding you, hinting that I want a gift or that I expect you to throw a surprise party, something like that. So behind the information is a whole series of intentions and those intentions are informed by what I want, our relationship, etc. All the things that we've talked about in this and the other videos so far. So what is it that, that shapes these actions? How do we define these actions? Again, it's the relationship between the speaker and the person they're addressing, their audience or addressee. That tells us, that can help us understand the nature of the actions that the sp speaker is performing. Who are they to each other? Are they strangers? Are they lovers? Are they enemies? Are they friends? Are they relatives? What does the speaker want? And what do they want specifically from the person they're talking to? The river merchant's wife, she wants a happy life and she specifically wants her husband to return. Those are two you know, partial ways of describing what the speaker wants. And of course, what has prompted the speaker to speak? Why is this happening right now? Why is it that they need to make this speech now rather than some other time? And once we've done that, once we've answered these questions, we can start identifying the specific verbs that describe what this speaker's doing. They're attacking, they're accusing, they're apologizing, they're defending, they're encouraging, they're begging, they're seducing, etc. And these individual actions combine to express the governing intention or the overall want, the overall desire what the speaker's trying to do with this speech as a whole. So I might flatter my audience with compliments, tell them how beautiful they are, but then frighten my audience with fears of growing old and ugly. You're beautiful now, but one day you won't be. And then I say, because of that, why don't you take advantage of your beauty now and go to bed with me? So all these individual actions, the flattering, the frightening, the inviting, they're part of the overall intention. They all go together to form this overall desire of seducing the lover. That's the overall purpose. And this is a specific poem I'm talking about uh, to his coy mistress, which we will read later on this semester. So thinking about how the individual actions combine to, as tactics, as strategies, to solve some larger problem, to accomplish some overall goal. And again, sometimes there's contradiction, there's inconsistency. Some actions may seem to be at odds with each other. Flattering your audience and then telling them that one day they'll grow old and ugly is in some sense a bit of a contradiction, but they fit together as part of the overall goal. So this leads us to our final thought, which is that the speaker need not be conscious of all of his or her governing intentions or poetic actions. Like I said, some actions and intentions may even contradict one another. The river merchant's wife, her feelings of, of anger or despair or loneliness or betrayal even that her husband is gone, in some sense contradict with her expressions of great love and desire and devotion for him. Her intention perhaps to warn him even a little bit or point out to him that he's not there and he should be is in some sense in tension with her desire to say come home and she, again she may not be as a character even aware of all these things that she's doing and that's the beauty of the poem is that we can see through her words all the contradictions and tensions and so think about this for yourself what are the thoughts feelings assumptions and desires that motivate you even when you're not aware of them try to pause every now and then and think about what is going on that makes me feel or do this thing that I might not be explicitly conscious of and when do your desires conflict with one another maybe you have a desire to do well on that exam get a good grade but you also have a desire to go out and party with your friends how do you resolve those that's a very simple example of the complex kinds of contradictions and tensions that we see in poems and why they give us such a wonderful insight into 
individual experience and human experience in general. So that's the end of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please contact me via email. Otherwise, I will see you next time.